you that. Is it safe to put my drink on this electric? Thanks. <laughs> it's a way of finding out from understanding behaviour. Good. Good evening, everybody. I see there's some people up there as well. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Good. So, okay. Uh, what shall I do? Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, that's it. I should start talking about happiness by design. Um, let, me, uh, let me start, though, well, let me start, actually, by um, discussing what happiness is. Uh, of course, there's been two and a half thousand years of ethical discourse about this question, and I'm going to solve it in the next 20 minutes. Um, <coughs> the, well, actually, let me, let, me, let me start with how happiness is typically measured and why I don't think that's an appropriate way to do it. So nearly all of what you hear about the evidence, about whether money and marriage, jobs and unemployment and all these things make people happy or not, nearly all of that evidence comes from asking people questions that ask them to give global answers to how satisfied they are with their own individual lives overall. The wording varies, but typically it's how satisfied are you with your life overall. And well, it takes someone about three it takes someone about three seconds on average to answer that question. So they're clearly not thinking about the question because it would take a long time actually to think about that in its in its absolute fullness. And so the question is, well, what are they doing? Well, actually, we don't really have much evidence on what they are doing. But um, to answer that quickly, they're if they're thinking about anything at all, they're thinking about the things that they think should make them happy. So if I was answering that question, I might immediately draw down my job, my family, uh, my house maybe, um, the things that I think should affect how I feel. And income actually plays a significant part in people's reports of life satisfaction. They are nearly always constructions. Actually, most of us don't routinely go around thinking, hmm, how satisfied am I with my life nowadays? <laughs> You'd kind of be a little bit crazy if you did that, and you probably wouldn't be very happy. Um, in contrast, I think, we should be looking much more directly at people's experiences of happiness. Towards the end of Thinking Fast and Slow, Danny Kahneman draws a distinction between evaluation and experience. Um, my definition of evaluation is a little broader than he has in the book um, and, I'll come, and I'll come to that in more detail again in a second but let's talk about experiences if I asked you an experience based question it would be how are you feeling right now how, how happy are you right now no, don't answer that question I don't really want to know um, how, how, how angry are you how anxious are you how stressed are you how much joy are you feeling how much pain are you in now it seems to me that just intuitively, they're much easier questions to answer. And if you go to your doctor, in fact, and you've got a pain in your leg, one of the questions he or she will ask you is how much it hurts. And it seems to me that you're, in, you're a pretty good guide to giving an answer to that question about how you feel right now. In contrast, in answering the question of how satisfied I am with my life overall requires me to make well, I don't know what it requires me to do, but it requires a lot of things, perhaps including comparison processes, either with myself in the past, my expectations about the future, other people now. The pain in my leg just hurts, and it's a 6 out of 10. Now, of course, that will be influenced by how much pain I've experienced in the past, how much pain I might, ex might expect to experience in the future, and other people's pain. But it feels like it's much more absolute, much more experiential, definitely, mm -hmm. much more located in the experiences of people's lives. <clears throat> now, let me give you a little story that I've told many times, and I apologise for those that have read the book and seen me talk before. I think it's a good story that draws a distinction between evaluation and experience. I went for dinner with a friend of ours. We've known her for a very long time, and she works, or worked, actually. This is quite significant. She worked um, for Medialand, shall we call them. And um, she spent the whole, of the whole of the evening complaining about her boss, her commute, her colleagues, her day-to-day -day job, every bit of her experiences at work were causing her pain and misery. And then without any hint of irony at the end of dinner, she said, of course I love working at Media Land. 
Now, actually, see, you laugh, but that's how a lot of us live our lives. We live our lives in the stories that we tell about the things that we think should make us happy. This is a great organisation. It's somewhere that she's always wanted to work. Her family and friends are very proud and jealous and pleased that she works there. How could she not be having a great time? The story that she's telling herself is that she's very satisfied with working at Media Lab. But her experiences sit in sharp contrast to that evaluation. Um, one of the headlines of one of the interviews that I did was, this book will make you quit your job, uh, that I did for the New Statesman. Uh, that isn't the intention of the book. Um, actually, if you do, then you're probably not very happy in it anyway, so good luck to you. But it at least asks you to think about whether what you think about <laughs> makes you happy or not in the experience of your lives. Another, perhaps not fantastic advert for the book, is that a colleague uh, split up with her boyfriend of seven years um, after reading the book, because again, she was living in an evaluation, she realised, of an ideal boyfriend. He ticked all the boxes, except actually the day-to-day -day experiences, sat in sharp contrast to that story. So I think one of the measurement issues, and of course it leads into the recommendations about what might make you feel happier and feel better, is to essentially pay less attention to the stories that we tell and much more attention to the experiences that we have. Now, <clears throat> within those experiences are all the adjectives that I outlined just now. Joy, contentment, anger, worry, stress, pain and misery. But I think significantly, alongside those experiences of what we might call pleasure, sit another important and separate category of experience that I call purpose. The things that we find that are fulfilling, meaningful, worthwhile, and in contrast, the things that we find pointless, purposelessness, and futile that <coughs> make up the richness of our daily experiences. And, you know, much of our academic research is informed by personal insight and personal stories. And um, as someone who's always thought of himself, I think, long before I got into happiness research, as a pretty good happiness maximizer, um, I, was I was faced with the choice. I was faced with the choice. It makes it sound a bit slow. I started thinking about whether to have children or not. And... If I'd looked at any of the happiness data at that point, it would have been, on balance, no, you shouldn't bother. Because at, ki because at best, kids are neutral in their effects on happiness. Uh, we can explore some of the reasons why that, why that is, very obvious reasons why that is, but um, most of the data suggested that I shouldn't bother. But most of those data <coughs> were based upon the life satisfaction reports, and in some cases, people's experiences of um, pleasure and pain. Danny Kahneman had published around that time the day reconstruction method. Some of you may know about. That was when I was, that was, when I was working with him in Princeton about a decade ago. Um, and basically you carve up yesterday into a series of episodes as if in a film and you rate how happy you are in each of those activities and experiences. Say who you're with and how you feel. Um, and children in those data um, are just below housework uh, in, terms of their, <laughs> in terms of their impact on... Uh, experienced happiness. So, not particularly pleasure-making. But it struck me that actually having children might make me differently happy, if not happier overall, by increasing the experiences of purpose that I have in my life. And actually, I mean, of course, you could say this is all complete bullshit because it's cognitive dissonance, but actually having had children, I think that's true. I think that, that my kids, you know, when they when they read to me the same story for the 10th time, um, you know, when, they, when I'm teaching them the times tables, which takes them a long time, um, it's not particularly fun. Um, there's many things I can think of that would be more fun, including housework. But <laughs> those experiences do feel like they're worthwhile. They do feel purposeful, they do feel meaningful, they do feel fulfilling. But importantly, they feel that in the experience. Purpose has been talked about for a very long time, but never as an experience. 
Always there's an evaluation. Does my life have meaning? I don't give a shit about whether your life has meaning or not. I care about the meaning of moments, not the meaning of life. My happiness as a father doesn't come from the story that I tell about how great it is to be a dad in the moments when I construct a story. It comes in all the moments of the activities that I engage in with my children when we're reading, when we're learning the times table. It's located, purpose is, is, is in the experience of life, not in the story that I tell. <clears throat> and so um, <clears throat> my conclusion in the first part of the first bit of the book is that happy lives are ones that contain the right balance for you of experiences that you find fun on the one hand and fulfilling on the other. They won't be in equal measure and they won't be the same for everybody. Some people are more pleasure machines, some people more purpose engines. But what I think I can say is that if you've got very much of one and not much of the other, you could be a little bit happier by sacrificing a tiny bit of the things you've got lots of for a bit more of the thing you haven't got much of. So if you're out having lots of fun, a little bit of purpose might not go amiss. If you're an academic at the LSE, having fun once in a while is fine. <laughs> <coughs> <clears throat> so, that's it. The pleasure purpose principle. And I think that's, that, that leads us to somewhat different conclusions about the determinants of happiness. Um, in, in most of the evaluation data, in fact all of it, I think there's a, a U-shape in age. People start off satisfied with their lives, they have life, and they get more and more miserable until they reach about my age, in the mid-40s. Um, and they're about as miserable as they get, especially if they're a man. And then it starts to get better insofar as they don't die and, uh, or kill themselves because suicide rates are higher in men in their mid-40s now. Uh, and it starts to increase from about the 50s onwards um, through till towards the end of your life. Of course, the last few weeks are not very good. Um, <laughs> so um, all the life satisfaction data show this, but experience data don't show this. It's a bit messier. Some of the more emotional states start to decline with age. Most of the measures are a bit flat with age. What's very interesting in some US data that we're looking at is that purpose is particularly low, experience is a purpose, I mean, is especially low in young adults. So people up to about 25 have very low um, <coughs> levels of purpose relative to pleasure, relative to other people's ratings of purpose. So at least to different conclusions. Income, the effect of income on life satisfaction, in spite of what you might be told by some people, always increases in life satisfaction. The effects get smaller, but they're always significant and positive. Um, they, in some data that Kahneman and Angus Deaton have looked at in the US, reports of experienced happiness, that is daily mood, do not increase after $75,000. That is, if you have 750,000, 7 million, 75 million, you're no happier. So you might have different policy conclusions that come from focusing on experiences compared to evaluations. Okay, that's the first part of the first bit of the book. I want to now give you the second bit of the first part of the book, which is the other academic contribution, if you like, before we move into some of the more action-based uh, approaches. Um, <clears throat> when we've looked at data before, at what, cause, at what causes happiness, we've focused on life satisfaction, I've said that. We've also done something else. We've assumed that the input, money, marriage, unemployment, sex, leads directly to the output, happiness. Well, when does, when does an input suddenly just become an output? Anyone, in, anyone trained in Econ 101 knows there's a production process that converts inputs into outputs. Companies don't take land, labour, capital, and suddenly they're widgets. They take those inputs and convert them into widgets through a production process. So a company can make more widgets if it has more inputs, but also if it has a more efficient production process. So, analogously, you can be happier if you have more inputs, money, marriage, sex, jobs, but also if you have a more efficient production process that converts those inputs into the output of happiness. So what does the production process for happiness look like? Well, the single word is 
attention. We are what we pay attention to. Put simply, does money make people happier? Well, it depends on how much attention they pay. Does marriage, does sex, it depends on how much attention they pay. Now notice, pay attention, that's quite critical. Attention is a scarce resource. By paying attention to one thing, you're necessarily not paying attention to something else. Well, the simple answer then to being as happy as possible is to allocate attention optimally. To pay attention to the inputs, the things, the stimuli that vie for your attention in proportion to the impact upon your happiness. To pay attention to the things that make you feel pleasure and purpose and to withdraw attention from the things that make you feel pain and futility. And we'll get into some of that in a bit. But the really important behavioural science in, uh, insight is that much of your attention is allocated unconsciously and not consciously. Most of what we do simply comes about rather than being thought about. You're making two to 10,000 decisions every day. If you had to think about all of those, your head would explode. Most of them are done through unconscious, automated, habitual processes. And in fact, that's a very efficient thing for the brain to do. It wants to conserve attention and energy. It doesn't want to pay attention to everything all the time. So once you've locked the house a few times when you come out, once you've turned the oven off, once you've cooked a meal a few times, once you go to the office the same way every day, your thinking system, system two in thinking fast and slow, converts it into your automatic system, system one, and makes it a habit. So that when you think about whether you've turned the oven off, whether you think about whether you've locked the house, when you start going to, to this meeting that's on another day somewhere else the wrong way, you don't realise you've turned the oven off, whether, you, whether you've turned it off. You don't know whether you've uh, you know, locked the house and you're suddenly going the wrong way to this meeting. Because you've encoded a system two effort into a system one habit. Think of sports stars. They're the best examples. Spending a lot of time consciously, effortfully practising their tennis strokes or their golf shots. That then gets converted from a system two effort into a system one automatic process. So that such that by the time it's in a system one habit, the worst thing a sports star can do is under pressure to think about how, how to play their shots. Because that's when they choke. So it's a very efficient system. The brain is remarkable. It's evolved over billions of years. 5,800 if you're a creationist. And it's, it's evolved to, to help make life easy for us. And most of the time, it does a really good job of that. The fact that you're here now, <laughs> today, is a remarkable achievement, that you did most of it quite effortlessly. But of course, sometimes, and you know, Kahneman spent the whole career showing the biases, heuristics, and mistakes that System 1 sometimes makes when it's faced with its decisions. And, and you know, we, obviously, I'm not going to go, go into well, any of those now. But the critical insight given all of this, given the fact that, you know, you're, you're more likely to buy um, French wine in a supermarket if there's French music playing in the background. And you don't know that you're more likely to do that because you're unaware of the associations that your system one is making to help make life easier for you. You don't really know whether you want the French or German wine. Um, you don't really know about the price, the claret, whatever. Ah. I can hear French music, I want French wine. If you put an attractive woman on the front cover of a loan, you can charge 25% higher interest to women and to men. Why? I don't really know whether I want this loan on these terms. System one, always present, always active, always engaged, is trying to make your life easier for you. It sees an attractive woman and it sees an attractive loan. In a hospital in London that we're working with, um, Pumping citrus lemon smells around the wards makes it significantly more likely that people wash their hands. Why? Clean smell, clean hands. Now, in all of these cases, and a million others that I could go through, no one actually knows why they're doing it. You can't get at the unconscious drivers of people's behaviour by conscious questions about why they intend to do what they did, which doesn't explain anything anyway, or why they've just done it. We're driven by very local, situational, contextual influences on our behaviour that we're largely unaware of. 
If you're in an Olympics Games bout and you're randomly assigned red or blue before your judo contest or whatever fighting bout where you're trying to kill each other but you actually don't, you are twice as likely to win if you're wearing red than if you're wearing blue. Now, that's random assignment at the start of the bout. That's a huge effect. Make sure you wear red. You probably fight a little bit harder, but you're almost certainly seen by the judges as having fought harder. Because red is an aggressive sexual colour, blue a softer creative colour. All of these effects are operating all of the time, in all of your environments that you're acting in. So, therefore, the way you're going to be happier, well, the way you're not going to be happier is by trying to think yourself happier. <clears throat> if you think of any self-help book, what a self-help book says is be positive. Yeah, no shit, I kind of worked that out. How do I actually do that? Or it's, it's nearly always, nearly always, look at, look at the self-help books, all of them, every single one of them, are basically changing the way you think. But since how you think doesn't affect most of what you do anyway, <laughs> it's not a particularly good place to start. And actually, it's really hard to change your mind about stuff. Changing your mind about stuff is really difficult. If you think about the last time you changed your own mind about anything significant, it was a long time ago if at all. I'm going to go on for a few more minutes. Um, I like having a little rant about changing your mind because you, what you do is you have, a, you, you have this belief constructed probably from some system one process somewhere or from a source of information that you trust, wherever that comes from, and you believe it. And then you search for evidence to support the belief. And when you find evidence to, to, to show you're right, you're obviously right. And it reinfirms your belief. Now what happens when you find evidence that doesn't support your belief? Oh, well, then you're very good at telling a story, a nice little counterfactual about why that evidence doesn't apply to what you believe. <laughs> and then you're even more right to believe what you did in the first place because you're very clever at finding a story that explains away the evidence. And you carry on believing what you did in the first place. Hard to change minds. Your mind doesn't affect most of what you do anyway. So why not instead? The US subtitle uh, to my book is different to the UK one because at the last minute in the US, they said, you know what, they won't get that finding pleasure and purpose in everyday life stuff. They need to be more directed. So the US subtitle says, change what you do, not how you think. So it's an action for happiness. Um, it's about doing stuff. So thinking is really important in allowing you to not then think. So you need to reflect, use your system too, your Mr. Spock brain, and think about how you can design your environment, hence the title of the book, or organize your life, organize your day in ways that make it easier for you to do stuff that makes you happier and harder to do stuff that makes you miserable. Do you know the basic behavioral science lesson? This is the really basic insight. If you want to do something, make it easier. That's it, yeah, no shit, but you don't do it. If you think about your own lives, you spend so much of your time making it really hard to do the things that you want to do, the things that you probably know will make you happier if you thought about them, and really easy for you to do the things that you don't want to do. Some of the insights are obvious but overlooked. All of the data now are compelling across a whole range of situations and contexts and behaviours that our behaviours are really driven by how easy they are. If you live near a fast food outlet, you're more likely to gain weight. Your opportunity to eat more, to cheat more, to behave in all sorts of ways are driven by the opportunity to. We are creatures of our environment. You need to be really humble about that. We all do. Don't start thinking that you can overcome environmental influences and you've got this Mr. Sprott brain that's stronger than, than, than uh, everyone else's. You are a reptile. You've evolved over billions of years. It helps make your life a lot easier. And so what you need to do is accept that fact, get over yourselves, accept that fact, design your environment in ways that make it easier for that reptile to run around run around, do they run around? I don't know what, what they do, crawl around, whatever, um, in, in ways that you know are making you happier because you're not thinking about it now. It's a bit like designing a park for a dog. You design, you spend a lot of time designing the parks, organising your life, organising your day, and then you just let the dog off the lead and let it run around, and it runs around without having to think too hard about what it's doing, saving the knowledge that it's running around in ways that make it broadly happy. Because, you know, constantly thinking about and monitoring your happiness is bloody hard work. 
You need a little bit of feedback from the experiences. I'll shut up in a minute. You need a little bit of feedback from your experiences to know whether you know, your job, your partner, the things you're doing are actually making you feel pleasure or purpose on a day-to-day basis. You need that. You need that monitoring. You need that light touch. But then once you've got that feedback, you need to then design your environment and let the dog run around freely. Because I'd like to think that being happier, what we understand about automatic processes and habits, can actually be done relatively easily and relatively effortlessly once the automatic system is engaged and once habits are formed or habits are broken without then constantly having to keep thinking about being happier by willing yourself to be. This is about changing your environment, the design power as opposed to willpower. Design power rather than willpower. That's quite a nice place on which to finish, isn't it? That'll do for the first bit. I'm not finished yet. So, thank you, Paul. Um, so, on your seats, you should hopefully all find a little action card. You, you've probably seen these before if you've come to one of our recent events. What we'd like you to do is to think about your own reactions to what you've just heard so far. There's more great wisdom to come in a moment, but before we start hearing some of Paul's interpretations of what he's just shared with you in terms of practical actions, it's great if you could each think about what this means for you. So, we've heard two big things. We've heard one that maybe happiness is about not just pleasure, but about purpose. So maybe let's think about what are the things that bring those moments of the experiences of pleasure, but also of purpose, and maybe think about recent experiences today, yesterday, what's brought pleasure, what's brought purpose, what's brought pain, what's brought futility in your lives. But then the second thing is that this conversion mechanism is our attention. So what are we paying attention to, and what is the environment we put ourselves in, the proximity to fast food, the journey to work, the relationships we tend to have every day, whatever it is that we have some control over, what could you do to change your environment that would actually lead to more experiences of pleasure and purpose. So there's only probably room for one or two thoughts on your car, but now let's each take sort of 30 seconds and write down a couple of personal observations of either recognitions of things that bring pleasure and purpose or things that you could potentially change to create a bit more, design a bit more happiness. If you don't have a pen, we have pens around the room. Alex has got some pens at the back, so put your hand up if you need a pen to write something down. And if you find yourself with more of a question than an action, that's fine. If you can make it an action, great. But if it's more of a, I'd like to just think a bit more about this, and then the next session is going to be reflecting on some of your feedback on this. So let's just generate our personal reactions to what we've heard so far as well. Okay, it looks like lots of you have already stopped writing and started talking. That's exactly what we'd like you to do now. So, could you please each turn to somebody next to you, and if you don't know them, introduce yourself, say hello. Don't leave anybody out, so get into either pairs or threes if there's someone missing. And just share for about 30 seconds each something you've written down with the person next to you. fair to say it sounded like that generated some opinions and some discussion. Very good. Um, Paul, do you honest? Thank you. Um, so look, I'd love to hear, we'd love to hear some of your actions, in particular things you found yourself observing or thinking that maybe you, you might do differently or things that clearly affect your experiences of pleasure, purpose, happiness based on what we've heard. So who would like to share something they either heard themselves saying or that someone shared with them? Yes, please. We've got some microphones in the audience, I think. Alex, do you want to... This lady here. Um, It's actually the guy next to me. I thought. (laughs) No, I thought he was really good because his um, his actions were very practical. Is that a man thing? But his were like he plays the guitar and he wants to play it more. So he said he would take the guitar out from under his bed with the amp and put it in a place where. So that way it's not such a faff to get the guitar out. So I, I thought his, um, I thought they were very practical. 
think mine were a bit, I mean, I like what you said about we are what we pay attention to, and I think sometimes in my day-to-day -day life at work, I'm here with my boss, um, <laughs> so now I'm sweating. Um, so sometimes I do focus on all the shit things at work and the things I don't like, and I think it's really easy to go down a negative road when you start thinking like that, so I, I'm going to try to focus on more positive things at work. Okay, thank you. So there's a couple of things there. One is a very nice example of designing an environment with getting your guitar out so you see it more. Um, and then a, a sort of behaviour when it works. Thank you. Let's, let's just hear a few before we start reacting to them. So lady here as well. Um, there's a microphone. Ah, thank you so much. So the, well, so let's, let's take the one on the end here, because this lady here had a hand up, and then we'll kind of... The one. Was, it, was it you that had your hand up there? So this lady here, and then we'll go to the one back in the middle afterwards. Alex, can you get that one? Hi. Um, I think as well it's important to be grateful for the things around you. So acknowledging um, what's good and not... Um, not focusing on the negative things around you. So I think if you, if you be more positive, it brings more positivity in your life. You be more grateful for what's going on around you. Okay, so sort of consciously noticing the things that you're grateful for. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh, this lady here, um, Alex. Sorry. There's a microphone coming on the other side, actually. There we go. Um, I've been trying to design in my environment, work environment, since two years, since I had a baby. And I've been... I have a little office where I should go every day, but I don't. I try to just, I don't know, I find excuses not to go. So I stay home in my, you know, <laughs> jeans and just uh, try to work from there because I'm flexible. I can. I don't have to work nine to five, but I just have to finish the work. I find that completely hard. I know what I need to do. So how do I, it's, you called it design, not willpower? But I don't know how to. It seems like willpower, and I'm losing. Great. So that's a really, that that's battle. A lovely, that's a lovely example. So, Paul, how do we design, overcome the willpower thing? We'll, we'll come back to that. Let's just take a few more examples. I want to hear from the audience, really. Let, lady here, and then this gentleman here. Am I meant to remember all of this? <laughs> we'll, come, we'll, we'll, we'll come back. I'm in cognitive decline. Now. <laughs> this is happening. It comes earlier than we expected. I've, I've had a bit of a light bulb moment because I've been looking at productivity recently, trying to become more productive at work. Sorry, where's that? I can't yeah. see. Oh, okay, and. Um, been speaking to people about getting your boss head and your work ahead sorted so that when you're looking at how productive you can be working out so that's the design really the boss bit and then the work a bit so I think I to suddenly realize that's what I need to do in my life rather than constantly thinking about trying to make myself happier just to, to look at it overall and then come up with simple ideas probably um, and then happiness just will happen won't it I suppose that's the idea anyway. that's it yeah. that's it yeah. You Sounds quite easy, the... is it? Yeah, well you, well, you need to buy the book, obviously, to learn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just tell that easy. There was, a, there was a gentleman, thank you for that. There was a gentleman in the middle here. Oh, sorry, this one here, thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm quite a happy bugger, so I'm feeling good about life. Um, but one of the things that I struggle with is stopping work. I love work, and I'm feeling like oh, mm. it's good to recognise a regular bedtime, all of that. Um, so I was thinking as a sort of design orientated behavior, I have a tendency of just working late into the night. At 9.30 or something like that, setting the lights to go off on a timer, so the work that I'm, room that I'm working in is suddenly dark, and it's like a reminder, <laughs> like, you shouldn't be working, and then I'm gonna have to consciously go and turn them back on, if that would be the case, or just download a computer program that has a timer and it just turns your computer off at that time. And yeah, that would some colleagues me. sitting in the front row could work a bit harder. So, maybe they should just... so yeah, <laughs> just you know, maybe that will just encourage me to put the work down. There's always work to do, so whatever, just yeah. you know, and then go and do my reading and meditate and go to bed, and you know, that would be good. That was my design. So know. before we leave this section, and Paul comes and reflects on some of all these, are there any other people with a kind of burning example of an action or something they were really keen to share? So, lady over here, we'll take that one there, and then a lady near the camera over there, and then we'll hand back to Paul to. Carry on. Um, yeah, so my thing is running. I'd like to go running more. And I think the issue is, I think it's going to be more difficult and less fun than it actually is in reality. Because when I'm at home and warm and I kind of think, oh, I'll just stay in, I'll just have something to eat instead, um, I think <laughs> that's the best option. <laughs> and, so, and so I do that a lot of the time. But when I do go out running, and then I'm out in nature and it's lovely and I feel, I feel great when I'm doing it and I feel great afterwards. Um, and so it's, it's not as difficult as I thought it was going to be. So I think I've made 
I've made a poor judgment for the times when, you know, that I've, I've misjudged what, what it's actually going to be like and then kept not making the good decision. So that's an example of the story we tell ourselves undermining the experience, isn't it? Yeah, maybe shit. Do you want me to try? And, am I, am I do meant to do that? something do about to, this? Am I meant to kind yeah, of say right. something in response to that? Well, let me. So, so first of all, so so let me let me try. And, I'll try and deal with <laughs> with all those comments. It's really quite difficult to decide to design and do. They're the three chapters in part two of the book. Decide, design, do, and the decide bit is actually a critical bit. It's about it's about ensuring that the decisions we make about the things that are going to make us happier are actually going to make us happier and, and aren't sometimes the stories that we tell. So the guitar playing might actually be a good example, and the working less might actually be good examples of things that would make you happier if you did more of one less of the other. Uh, but you need to really be, first of all, be sure that they are. Sometimes they will be a story. A number of people say, I want to, I'm, I'm sure you can play the guitar, but I'm, so I'm not going to use this example, but I want to learn a musical instrument. Uh, I want to, um, uh, you know, I want to exercise more. I want to learn to cook. Well, do you really? Why haven't you started then? You, our, our past behaviours are really good guides to future ones. Our intentions explain about a quarter at most of, of any change in action that follows. We're all full of good intentions. We're all full of good stories. We're all much nicer tomorrow than we are today. Uh, but tomorrow never comes. So, so part of the first question really is. Is this a decision that is actually going to make me happier in the experience of doing so? And so maybe the running example is one that actually does. You get the experience when you're out running that actually this is something that does make me feel happier. And probably working a bit less would make you feel happier if you could turn the lights on or off, whichever it is. I'm not sure which way around it goes. Turn them off um, and uh, have some fun with the lights off. Yeah, maybe that's what. Um, <laughs> I, knew there, I knew there was a connection there somewhere. <laughs> um, so that's the first thing to decide and that does require this feedback it does require this monitoring of those activities and experiences to, to ensure that they are actually decisions that are going to make us better off and you can get feedback from your own experiences you can also ask other people for some advice as well and for some feedback um, people that may be a bit less attached it's hard to find the right people sometimes but you want people that aren't as attached to the narratives as you might be People who, who actually pay attention to your experiences much more. And they, that can be quite a challenge, finding, finding those uh, people. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering what to say to the guests about what's going to be going on. <laughs> so have we, got, have we got a lot left still? <laughs> Brilliant. Mark, do you want to carry on? <laughs> where is he? Has he gone to the loo? It's like that Naked Gun film, isn't it, where he goes... <laughs> Good job he's not having a really long piss. <laughs> 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 so, so, so having having decided that these are the that these are the things that are going to make me happier, or doing less of these other things might make me less happy. Um, the design principles come in, and there are essentially um, four main ways in which you can design your environment to make things doing things more easy. And it's all about making it easier. It's, it's all about making it easier. And bringing that guitar out from under the bed and leaving it by the bed or by somewhere that you can play it is a very simple thing to do that will have a huge effect. Sometimes very, very small changes have massive effects. Um, if you made it... Oh, there was a thing about um, uh, you know, going out to your office. You need to, one of the things that we think about often is that having more choice makes us better off. But sometimes constrained choice makes us better off. If there was some way in which you could force yourself, your husband or someone else, to force you to stop working at five o'clock every evening and you knew that you could only work till five o'clock every evening, you'd be much more likely to go out to that office um, once you made it. Because you've got open-ended exchange rate between work and leisure. And you have too. There's an open-ended exchange rate. And once you start doing one, it's really hard to change. It's really hard to shift yourself into the alternative world. You need a nudge or a shove in order to you know, move you into the alternative world. And the way that you nudge yourself to do that is to prime yourself in ways you know, like the, the French music, like the citrus smell, like having a screensaver of a guitar, um, like having a screensaver on your laptop of someone playing the guitar. Um, you know, that would be that. And really interestingly, see, what we're, we're, we're not only stupid 
uh, we're not stupid, we're a little bit stupid, we're even stupid to our stupidity. So when you, when you put a screensaver on your computer that has a guitar on it, and you know that you're doing it to play the guitar, you're still more likely to play the guitar. Um, <laughs> my my uh, editor um, changed the password on her computer, so I'm not sure if it's the exact password, because it might have uh, implications for security at Penguin if I gave it to her. But um, uh, she, she, was she used to go to work and was kind of consumed by all the things she needed to do that day. I can't see that there's very much other than trying to sell my book. But anyway, so um, she, she would be kind of consumed by the whole day. And she's literally got a password that's like, that, that says hour by hour um, to prime her, to remind her, <laughs> to, to break it down a bit. Now, even though she knows she did that, she still says that still works. Right? So, so, you, can, so you can take advantage of the fact that you're a bit simple. Um, placebo, <laughs> effects, placebo effects work even when you know you're taking placebos. Right? That's how stupid we are. Um, you can design defaults and commitments. They're two separate entities, but they're broadly related. It's basically, you know, making doing the action easier, sometimes by just having a default that makes that the easiest thing to do. Um, your lights, could you could set timers. And the timers just go on and off at certain times of day and night. And that's it, they're set. And that will be the default. That will shut down or open it up, whatever. Um, commitments are really quite good. We like to be consistent with the public promises we make. So people who posted their weight loss targets on Twitter were more likely to lose weight than, than those in a randomised control trial that didn't. Why? Because you just want to be consistent with the public promises you make. Tell your friends you're going to go running. Uh, in fact, have a network, have, you know, t just post on, yeah, post on Twitter or social media, I'm going running tomorrow morning. You'd just be more likely to do it. That kind of, that, that public promise just makes um, these actions just a little more likely. Um, and, then, and then finally, norms, um, is we really do take the cues for our behaviour from people like us. The really obvious thing is, if you want to do something, hang out with people that do it. You'd just be much more likely to do it. We, we are social animals. We've evolved to take cues for action from others like us. I mean, even introverts like being around other people. They just like choosing who those other people are. Actually, first don't care, just like showing off in front of people. Um, so... You know, if, if you want to run more, if you want to play the guitar more, hang out with people that engage in those, those activities. Just the mere fact of being around them sets this norm, this reference standard, this network effect that makes, that makes an action more likely. I was particularly the most, perhaps one of the most challenging uh, questions or issues was to, it was almost like to be thankful, wasn't it? To be, what, what was the terms you used for being great? Um, yeah, to, to remind yourself to be grateful. That's really, that's really difficult because, do you know, like, like a lot of things that happen in people's lives <laughs> gives them perspective at the time. <laughs> and then 10 minutes later, they're back worrying about all the trivial things that they said they weren't going to worry about because this event has given them perspective. Um, and so I think some of the effects, some of the, even the big circumstances of people's lives, those effects don't actually last very long. And it is about remind, trying to design into your environment ways that remind you of that. You know, ways that draw attention, either through priming, defaults, commitments or norms, that draw attention to the fact that you feel grateful, that you want to, um, yeah, that you know, feel uh, this, sense of, this sense of gratitude. Um, one of the things that, that, that I know Action for Happiness are particularly uh, concerned or care about is helping other people. And... I'd like to say a few words about that now because, um, <clears throat> first of all, it's a really nice thing that people say. I want to help other people more. It's, you know, it's kind of, no, one, no one ever really says, you know what, I want to I be nastier. <laughs> I think I'm too nice, to be honest. I think I'm too nice. And actually, my action for happiness is to go and make other people miserable. <laughs> you rarely get someone say that. So it's clearly a nice intention. As I said, intentions explain about a quarter of our behaviour in health behaviour change, at most, at most a quarter. Three quarters of it is therefore explained by environment, by situation, by context, by the ease with which we can do these things. <coughs> so, what makes it easier to help other people? Well, I think one of the things that makes it easier to help other people is making it transparent and obvious, actually. Most behaviours, most good things that people do, in spite of what people will tell you, they kind of like a little bit of celebration or thank you of doing that. Public thank yous, public celebrations, even little private ones, 
make us, gives us the feedback that our actions are good. So it's not surprising that in the US, for example, much more than here, although we're doing it more here, you know, the naming of a park, the naming of a university building, the naming of a park bench, um, thanking the people that donated the money for that leads to significant increases in the charitable you know, giving. Well, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. I have absolutely no problem with the selfishness of altruistic acts. We've shown, and others have shown, in a, in a whole range of different experiments and trials, that actually one of the, 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 most, the most important determinant of giving, in fact, I'm not, this, is, this is true, is the warm glow that people get from the act of giving. If you take away the warm glow, you take away about 80% of the reason for helping other people. So what you need to do is make public, make salient, at least to the individuals, the feedback that they're getting that helping other people actually feels quite nice. To remind them that it does and that they then do more of it. Helping other people has this fantastic win-win. You feel good about yourself and other people benefit too. And we should not lose sight of the fact that you benefit from doing it. Because as I say, it's the most important determinant of our reasons for giving. Um, as I say, it's been shown in a number of different different field trials and in experiments. If you take away the, that warm glow, you take away the most important reason for giving. So I would make, I would make much more public, much more transparent people's pro-social behaviours. I can get a pretty good sense from talking to someone for a few seconds about a whole range of things. Their income, their social class probably to some degree, a um, whole range of things about them. I cannot, I cannot observe in those moments how generous they are. There's no feedback for that. There's no, there's no transparency to it. So finding ways in which we can design environments that make that feedback visible will increase pro-social behaviours. Um, may increase the extent to which people feel grateful too. Um, have I dealt with what, what, what come, oh, There was a lot. I, can't, I thought you were going to take notes or something or pass me the questions in one bundle. I was trying to make life easier for me than, than, than trying to do... Do, uh, uh, do, yeah, to do everything, everything at once. But the, the design bit, so just to go finally to the, to the kind of, well, so actually in the, in the book I have, I have a, a, a half a chapter that brings all this together in, in helping other people. Procrastination is the other half of that chapter because that's something that people, pretty much all of us do to some degree and you can use those principles to procrastinate less. But the do bit, decide, design, do, the do bit is actually just to get on and pay attention to what you're doing. Because it is this thing about getting the feedback, then just doing it, and then just letting it... I think you said it's really easy, isn't it? It's simple. It is. It's just like letting it, letting it go. You know, once you've... What you want to do, you see, you want to monitor your happiness, but not too much. So in one experiment where people were asked to listen to music and enjoy it, they reported being less happy than people that just listened to the music. <laughs> right? That is, that is, by the way, why I fucking hate organised fun. <laughs> right? Weddings, birthday parties, New Year's Eve, I'm told to have a good time, right? Well, I'm not going to have a good time when you're telling me to. I'm going to have a good time when you're not telling me to. So, for, by the way, for New Year's, have a spontaneous... Don't organise anything, don't plan anything, and have a spontaneous event that happens. You'll have a great time. Your expectations will be lower, um, and no-one's telling you to have a good time. Um, anyway, that's my tip for New Year. Um, yeah, my tip for Christmas while I'm at it, um, is uh, don't spend time with people you don't like. That's actually, that's actually a really, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that is actually a really basic insight for being happier, right? Spend time with people you like being with and don't spend time with people you don't like being with. That's why for so many people Christmas is a fucking miserable experience because they're, they're forced to spend people time with these people that the rest of the year they don't want to spend any time with, they don't want to go anywhere near them. That's the only reason you're seeing them is because it's Christmas. Um, anyway, so, um, that's a big story by the way. There's a big evaluation in that. Um, it's really interesting where some of these um, stories come from. Um, like why, how we tell ourselves that, that out of maybe a sense of duty perhaps that we, that we need to be spending time with, with these people and actually sometimes of course making yourself miserable a little bit miserable might make other people quite a lot happier 
Um, and that, I find that all the time. Um, and and um, at least from my perspective, I'm sure other people see it differently. But um, that's, you know, that, that, that's, that's clearly a big motivation for, for our uh, action. But, you know, if, if, if you're not finding something purposeful or pleasurable and someone else isn't finding it purposeful or, you know, pleasurable, you should probably ask yourself the question, why am I doing this? Because unlike money, which you can transfer around between time periods, you can literally spend less tonight to go out tomorrow night. Um, happiness is not fungible in the same way. If I'm making myself miserable now, I better be damn sure I'm going to be happy tomorrow. Because if I'm not, it's a significant waste of happiness. Lost happiness is lost forever. You don't get it back. So if something's not pleasurable nor purposeful, give it up. Um, and, and actually a lot, of, um, a lot of things are purposeful. That's, that's where I think the experiences of purpose matter. Because going out running, maybe playing the guitar sometimes isn't fun or whatever, you know, but actually does feel like it has a purpose to it. So, so I think those trade-offs might not be so important when we add purpose into the set of experiences. But yeah, so with do, just get on and do it. We're nearly always happier when we're paying attention to what we're doing and who we're doing it with. And when we're not distracted by other um, demands on our attention. So one of the most significant things you can do is uh, turn your phone off and get away from the internet. Well, unless you're tweeting brilliant things about me, Kate. Um, <laughs> then, uh, because even, even if you're not paying attention to your phone, your unconscious attention is being drawn to it. So it's why you've all had this experience, your phone vibrates in your pocket, you take your phone out, and there's no one there. Phantom vibration syndrome, they call that. Um, it's basically, you were expecting a text from someone, surely, you've got friends, it's been like three days, uh, and, and, uh, and you take your phone out and you've still got no friends. Um, so, distra avoiding distraction, you see, you can do that, Effortless, effortfully by doing mindfulness training. It's, this is essentially being mindful without having to work at it. So you can, you can do the mindfulness training programs, and they're great. They work for people who choose to do mindfulness and who stick with it. Um, but also you can think about just making being mindful easier. You can design environments and situations and contexts that help you pay attention to what you're doing and who you're doing it with and avoid distraction. Um, again, all, all in the interest of trying to make life a bit easier. Uh, good. Well, that was literally where we thought we would finish now, isn't it? And, uh, and then there's going to be even more, isn't there? It just keeps on giving without any books. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you better go and buy it. Um, this is neither pleasurable nor purposeful, so I don't know. I don't know what I'm right, that's it. I think I'll, I think I'll stop at that point. Please join me. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> So um, we, we've sort of wrapped it up there because this is one of those topics that actually works best in, in an interactive discussion. So Paul's very happy to take questions and more observations. Those are things that have come up. We've already heard some of your action ideas, but you may now have questions for Paul as well. So let's, let's, let's take that where it goes. So I think I saw a lady's hand up here, first of all. It's gone away again. No, to the gentleman here. There you go, Alex. That's fine. Thank you. Um, I think it's, it's obviously um, uh, very important to live um, more consciously and be aware of systems and so on. But a lot of people's lives are affected by big-scale systems which um, put them under stress, like uh, the availability of housing yeah. and uh, the cost of housing and so on. And I'm just wondering how this philosophy fits in with the way that big systems affect people's lives. Yeah, it is a good question. I mean, I don't want to... It's like for, so, because Mark said in the intro, it's quite interesting that, you know, 20 years of my academic life has been largely around policy makers. And this last couple of years, I've been writing a book about individual decision making because it can reach a wider audience, frankly. Um, and so, um, I, I, it is about individual decisions within the constraints that people face within their lives. So, I don't want to trivialise the circumstances of people's lives. They clearly, they clearly matter, and the stresses that you're under with with housing, with all the things that you mentioned, and, and other things too, are clearly going to significantly affect someone's. Happiness, all of the structural problems. Um, this is more about an agency. This is about even within whatever structural situations and circumstances you find yourself, there are little things that you can do that will make you happier whilst you're trying to bring about those other changes. 
Um, you know, it's not either or. And I think sometimes people get into to this argument about, you know, is it structure or is it agency? Well, whilst the structures are in place, work on a bit of agency, but you can still change the structures. And actually, quite importantly there, um, that people who want to change systems, people that are angry for social change, um, on the one hand are feeling the emotion of anger, which on the face of it looks like a bad thing, but there's a lot of purpose in that. People that are out in protest, people out on the streets trying to change the world, are really quite optimistic about the extent to which they can do something, because why have they got out of bed? So there's a lot of purpose in what otherwise might be seen as experiences of pain. So the short answer to your question is, you know, design everyone, however, however their lives are constrained, or whether they are depressed or otherwise, can do little things to, to make themselves happier. And some of those things, all, most, nearly all of those things are really obvious. They are listen to music, help other people, go outdoors, spend time with people you like being with. They're all really obvious things. But we make it hard for ourselves sometimes to do any or all of those things, where another five minutes every day on, on each of them would just make you a little bit happier, whatever your circumstances. Just put what on that very interesting question, because yeah. this comes up quite a few events, yeah. balance between personal and yeah. societal. If you were sitting in a, uh, you know, a head of civil service or even you know, politician shoes with the knowledge you have of the well-being data and insights as to personal behaviour, maybe it's answered on, what would be your major recommendations to address some of the kind of challenges to our national world? Oh, wow, wow. So, um, <laughs> Prime Minister for a day, isn't it? I'd ban elections for a start once I was in power. No, so um, I think uh, that I, I, the, if you look at, I think if you look at the determinants, they are largely, at the individual level, they are largely those things that I've just you know, outlined. So, you know, spending time, it's an obvious thing to say, spend more time with people you like being with and less time with people that you don't like. So, organise society, you know, design environments that make it easier for people to do that. Lonely people are especially miserable, mm. right? Loneliness is a significant determinant of people's misery. So, so, so organise our society in ways that make it easier for those people to have access to other people. Uh, that would be. A, but not me. No, God, no. I don't like people that much. Sorry. Yeah, I don't really like that. <laughs> it's, well, no, actually, no. Well, that's well. That's, let's be clear. That's why I mean. That's why I mean. I didn't see where that came from, but that's why. That's why it's important that we talk about experiences of pleasure and purpose, because there could be some purpose in being with people that you find painful. There could be something that you learn from. Learning, learning new things from people is an experience of purpose. It seems to me. But if you're getting neither, and they're getting neither too, then I wouldn't bother. Well, you, because they would be getting the feedback of their own behaviours and their own actions and you would be getting the feedback of yours. Because sometimes that's really one of, the, one of the really critical challenges with helping other people. We make assumptions about the things that we think are going to make people better off by telling stories about the things that we think affect their lives. Um, and, and we don't pay enough attention to the feedback that they get for their own individual experiences because we're too busy telling stories about the things that we think they should be happier from. Policymakers do that all the time. Great. So let's hold that one there and let's come to um, this gentleman here and then we'll come back to the middle aisle here. Thank you. So first of all, you said you had very high expectations when you came in the room. You said that, that you were looking yes. forward to this. So, so you, better, you better say no. it's been a good experience. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic experience. Thank you very much. No, good information. Um, Feeding off what, what she was saying, and just to kind of clarify some of the yeah. great experience that you had tonight with your information. So you said that the American title was different from... Yes, the, the, sub, the subtitle to the, the book, subtitle. yeah. So you said change what you do, not what you think. Not how you think, right, so correct. It's, it's more about the action, and you mentioned design is power, right. not the willpower, right. etc. So, so I just wanted to mention that... Has this got louder? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this has got a bit louder. So what I've put down for my action for happiness was to, uh, to form a more structural designer type thing, was um, meditate for at least 30 minutes a day. Mm. And why I put that was one of the reasons was because I believe meditation can cultivate awareness. It's mostly mm -hmm. about awareness, about what your thoughts are. Right. And, and that correlates to what I think is how I act. Right. So, so often many of us have 
done something, we've put something to action without thinking. And it's been, a, it's been a problematic, it's been a disaster. And the whole saying, think before you act. But you seem to be going in a kind of different aspect by looking at, well, do, get feedback. You mentioned feedback and how important that is, but also do an action. Right. And what she was saying about the, um, the friends, you know, spend time with people that you like, don't like, and what she was referring to is, well, what can you learn from that? Yeah. The whole basis of psychotherapy is, what are you thinking? What, why are you acting like you are, which is causing great suffering? Yeah. Psychotherapy is, let's look at those ideas. How are you thinking? Why don't you like those people? What is it about them that you don't like? And you seem to be going more about, well, I'm designing my life that avoid those people with rather than reflecting on why don't I like them in the first place? Yeah, I, don't want to spend, I don't want to spend the whole, whole evening thinking about whether we should spend time with people that we like or don't like. That's not really the kind of point of it. I think the point of it is generally about getting feedback about things that feel pleasurable or purposeful and to move away from the narratives and the stories that we tell about how those things should feel um, when we're not paying attention to how they actually do feel. I think that's the, that's the, that's the main bit. And whether you're going to then form a, a judgment about whether you should spend time with these people or these other people is still then located, ultimately rooted in, I think, it should be rooted in, the experiences of pleasure and purpose that you get and they get out of that interaction. Um, now, the, the, just to be clear about the, the think and action, it is, it is, a, it is the, the title of change what, change what you do, not, not how you think. Because of the point that I made before about changing the way that you, you think about things is a really difficult thing. It's why self-help books sell so, so, so bloody well. You buy a self-help book, you try and do what it says, you can't do it, it makes you more miserable, and you buy another self-help book. That's why the single biggest factor predicting the purchase of a self-help book is having bought a self-help book in the last 12 months. So it clearly doesn't work. It clearly doesn't work. It's a huge market for it, and that's why it carries on not working. So instead, the change what you do is that Absolutely. Meditation, probably, you know, 30 minutes of it every day would be a great thing for you to do. Now, the question then for most people is why aren't I doing that? I, I know that that's going to make me, make me happier to engage in that, what I would call action, but I'm just not doing it. So it comes to all the design principles that just remind you and make it easier for you. Prime yourself, commit yourself to, have the thoughts that make it easier, surround yourself with friends that do it, that make that 30 minutes every day, 20 minutes, however long it's going to be, just easier for you to build into your day. Because most of the time when people say things like, I don't have time to do this. People say that to me about all the time. I go to the gym four times a week. And now people say to me, oh, yeah, but you, I, I don't have time to do that. Well, I don't have time. I'm really bloody busy. I'm doing all this great academic stuff, selling a book, got a family, but I make it a priority. And so it's about, it's about deciding, in the first instance, what things really are important to you. If meditation is important to you, to do it 30 minutes every day, then... Um, and I'm sure you probably do it anyway, but for other people that don't, it's about, it's about trying to organise your day and your life in ways that just make that easier for you to get into. Yeah. And, then, and then once you've done it, um, the evidence on health behaviour suggests that after about two months, it will become an automatic process. Yeah, well, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on deciding. You, you mentioned yeah. deciding there, and you mentioned yeah. why get out of bed, and why should you play that musical instrument. I guess I'm emphasising that aspect that you first have to think and even have willpower before you No, you act. need to get the decide bit. I don't want to get into an extensive bit, but, but the um, decide bit is, is about getting feedback, the light touch feedback on the things that you're doing about how they make you feel. If you want to call that thinking, then fine, call that, call that thinking. For me, it's the feedback. So it's, you know, lots of things that we do are driven by habit and we're just doing them because we're doing them without actually thinking, do you know what, thinking, we can call it that, without actually thinking, is this actually making me feel good or bad doing it? So, so can, I, can I share a personal example of that? So when I first came across Paul's thesis in the book, I started thinking, well, maybe I should pay more attention to my moment-by-moment -moment feelings and experiences. And I noticed that when I was using Facebook on social media, that generally at the end of that experience, I didn't feel happy. In fact, if anything, I felt a little bit more like weary of the world. And, you know, <laughs> and I was doing things that in principle should make you happy, connecting with others, sharing interesting things, whatever. But actually my experience of using social media didn't give me a particular boost. So I said, well, the, the thinking part of me said, if I'm trying to design my day-to-day -day life, you know, to, to get my other life, then I'm going to minimise the time I do that. So I've actually changed my interaction with social media because I was doing, I guess it is thinking, but it's, like, you know, observing <laughs> that this particular experience is not something that actually gives me the joy that maybe my story is telling me it should be. So I changed that behaviour. So I, I think, you know, the example of, you know, changing your guitar and all these other great things 
come from, as you say, a thinking. I could, I've consciously noticed. So there's two things. One is notice what does and doesn't yeah. make you and others happy or purposeful, and then in some way build it in. So just on that, you know that lady's example about gratitude and building yeah, habits? So um, yeah. I, you, there's a very famous thing that many of you know about, which is if you get people to write down things that have been good that day at the end of the day, then over time that, that has quite an impact on their self-reported mood. It's kind of conscious. Yeah, I don't think the RCTs would show that, actually, because they don't follow up people that stop doing it. Uh, that's interesting. Well, well I, I, was, I, I had tried it once or twice and stopped doing it, so yeah. I probably would have been I afraid. I started doing it, couldn't find three things, made me, made me, made me bloody miserable. <laughs> <laughs> One of, one's enough. So, I, so I, I was unsure how to make it happen and then found a site that sent, did, did a very good prompt, which is like some of the examples you've given. So each day, it just automatically sent you an email going, what's been good today? Yeah. And you replied to it. All you did was reply like any other email with things that have been good that day. And it turned, for, turned me from being like, why do I never stop and think about these things, to like 18 months I did that for mm. until the, the website stopped running. But it's like, that, there's, there's a... Yeah. There's a um, but it now makes me think, actually, if you do think about how, what's going to remind me to be thankful each day, a little email, a little reminder in your calendar that says what's been good today at the end of the day is not a bad kind of yeah. beha- like design change you can make to get yourself to Oh, of course. All of that requires thinking. I mean, it's, you know, it's, not, it's, not, it's not about not thinking. It's, it's about thinking to then not have to think. Yeah. So once you've got the email confirmation every day, you don't have to think about it. It's there, and you just send it back. Brilliant. Um, let's take gentleman here. Okay. I can, I can hear you, can other people? I'd love to hear a personal example from you. Oh, that, God. Yeah, go on. Uh, of where you had a very powerful personal experience of a different story against something you actually did and how that worked for you. Yeah, really interesting. So I start the book with a, with a, with a very personal story about having a stammer. It's called Stuttering into Happiness. Um, and it's still there. Um, it's not there very much anymore. And I think part of the reason that it's not there as much as it was is because I pay less attention to it. But critically, I'm paying attention to something different in my speech now, where previously I was paying attention to fluency, because that's what stammerers do. You know, How much have I stammered? And would judge the success or otherwise of any speaking situation based upon how many disfluences there were in that speaking situation. Instead, to pay attention on, have I communicated effectively? <laughs> it's a very different thing, actually. And actually, you notice most of the good speakers, it doesn't matter whether they're fluent or otherwise, they're telling a good story, they're able to communicate, they can engage. All the things that matter much more than the degree to which the speech is fluent. So it was a reorientation attention in two ways. One, away from just whether, whether I stand with it or not anyway, realising that actually, realising that people didn't actually care about as much as I did. That's one thing you do learn in life, isn't it? People don't actually really care about you as much as you think they do. Uh, you know, it's like when you have a new haircut, isn't it? You go into work, you think it looks great haircut, no one says anything. Um, you think you look really cool. Um, but they don't care. So no one actually really, no one actually really cares that much anyway. Um, and so I cared less. But there was a reorientation of attention away from one story, which was about the number of disfluences in my speech, to another story, which is in terms of the communication. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's one area where I think I've... Um, uh, reorientated attention consistent with the book, I think. Thank you for the question. This gentleman in the middle here said he's had it for a while. Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks, Paul. I'm interested in the world of work, and I'm wondering, yeah. can companies use your principles to make the world of work a happier place? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's like when you ask student essays, you've got to make sure that they can't just give you a one-word answer to them and get 100% or whatever. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> I think this is what I wanted to, Yeah, so it, it enables me to just maybe spend a couple of minutes more on experience as a purpose, I think, because it's in contrast to... Like, a lot of work practices are based upon achievement. You know, have we got to the top of Everest? Without considering the journey... It sounds like it's a very cliche thing to say, but the journey. Uh, up and down... <coughs> Right? Because actually climbing mountains is much more significantly dangerous on the way down than it is on the way up. In fact, three quarters or four fifths of the death occur on the way down. So actually, they, they don't even have a good time on the summit. So because they're thinking about coming down again, it's why they spend only about 20 minutes looking at the view. So, um, and they all say, again, when they get down the bottom, shoot me if I ever go back up again. And they all die if they carry on doing it. Mountaineers, you don't get any old ones because they stop. So um, there's something really about, something significant about all the costs that come from achievement focus without a focus on the purpose, the experiences that you have 
on the journey to the summit and down again. So I think in workplaces we could be paying more attention to people's experiences of purpose and not just whether goals are achieved. In the interest of the design principles, I'll try and keep this quick and brief, um, of you can have very big effects from very small changes. Um, feedback is absolutely critical. Many people in workplaces will start work projects and tasks that then get terminated or cancelled or changed um, and it feels like what they've been doing has been a waste of time. And they won't ever get the feedback that actually, you know what, it, did actually, it is actually worth it because it's contributed in some way towards something else that we're doing. And so um, Dan Ariely, as you, as you may know, has these experiments where people make Lego models and in one condition they get put in a box and in another condition they get broken down in front of their eyes and the bricks are passed back to people to make the next model. Now, get, putting them in a box is nothing, not, not, you know, you're not going to win any trophies for making Lego models, but that's much more pointless, no, much less pointless, sorry, much less pointless than seeing someone break the model down in front of your eyes. Now, what's, what's important there is not that people, not only that people feel more futility from having the bricks broken down in front of their eyes, but their ability to predict the time at which they want to walk out of the room is pretty poor. They think that the money will be enough, right? So they think that the, the pointlessness of this job is going to make it worth it for me because I'm getting a good salary for it. But actually, in the experience, it comes back to this point of lost happiness, lost forever. In the experience, it's just bloody horrible, and I don't want to keep doing it. And so there is a really interesting question about the exchange rate between remuneration and purpose. So I think for all of the reasons and many more that I could go on for, I think experience is a purpose are absolutely critical to work, because it's actually where most of us get our purpose from. Thank you. Let's hear a show of hands for final questions, because we haven't got very long left. Okay, so there's a lady here, then we'll take a lady on the side over here. Hi, so you talked about the balance between um, pleasurable and, and purposeful. Um, that sounds like, the, uh, like another term and phrase for hedonic or eudaimonic well-being. Mm -hmm. Now there's a concept but called... But eudaimonic in the experience, because eudaimonia typically is seen as an evaluative uh, sense. Right. So there's a concept, my, my question is actually about hedonic treadmill. Mm -hmm. So do you think there, are, there could be a eudaimonic treadmill as well? Right. Very or too much purpose? Yeah, very interesting question. So this is the idea basically that you get used to, that you kind of need a bigger hit, basically. That you need more drugs to get the same hit that you got previously when you're consuming pleasure. Um, it's an open research question about whether that would apply to purpose. Because it's interesting that I think most of the things that we, act, that we continue doing, so my weight training is a good example, it, it, you continue doing it, part of the motivation is because the experience is purposeful. There's a kind of project that comes to it, almost. And so maybe there might not be the same um, you know, kind of treadmill effects that you get with people's pleasure. There might or might not be. I think it's an open... I think, you know, the two words that come out of my mouth in any class, context matters, I say that all, all the time, students make t-shirts of it and stuff, is, and, that's, and that's true, context matters. And so I think the answer to your question will be, in some contexts, yes, in other ones, no. But we need the data to, in, in order to show that. Thank you, Paul. And let's just take this lady here as well. Oh, oh you get a second question. Yeah. <laughs> um, earlier on this evening, you said... Oh, I hate when people yeah, say that. I, I, I don't know what I said. I changed my mind now. <laughs> um, you said, at best, having kids is neutral in terms of happiness data. Yes, yes. Is that the same for men and women? Yes. So, um, I think the data... Uh, yes, I think that's, I think that's true. In, 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 and, and, and in experience data, the experience data that we've got most, most on comes from uh, women, actually. Uh, Danny's original day reconstruction method data was in text and women. We found it in German men and women. I don't know whether you want to extrapolate from Germany or not, but um, there, it's, it's, it's not particularly pleasurable. Um, there are some data on meaning in, par in new parents. I think fathers report meaning in life, this is report greater meaning in life from having children, mothers less so. So there are some gender differences there a bit. Um, the significant point, though, is why, why people don't... I get, a lot, I get a hard time from some people when I say, in terms of pleasure, children are largely a pain in the arse with moments of joy. In terms of purpose, they do bring you... I think they do bring you experiences of purpose. But I get a really hard time from, from parents. Somehow I must love my kids less if I say that, I don't, that they're not fun. Well, I don't 
really see that that is any correlation at all. But the reason that, they, that people struggle with this is partly because it's a story. It's a really important story that we tell, that we need to smash, by the way, that having children is going to make you happy. Bloody well, ain't. And, and, you should, and, we, and we should be much more honest about that. Part of it is smashing that narrative. And it's okay to say that, you, that, you, that your children get on your nerves and you still love them and you still treat them well. That's absolutely fine. But I think, I think importantly, it's because of a focusing effect problem. When I think about my children, when anyone here thinks about their kids, they think about them positively. They think about their kids, you know, my kids. And also, of course, you can't imagine not having them now. So, and, and of course, to lose them would be the worst possible thing that could ever happen. So all of those things lead to this construction that children must make us happy. But in the experiences, day to day, they bring considerable amounts of misery and worry and stress and all the things that weren't present before you had children. Um, but they do bring this experience of purpose, I think, a bit more. At least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> we, any more? No, I'm just reflecting on that from my own personal perspective. <laughs> <laughs> any sensible parent knows I'm, knows I'm absolutely right about that. You well, know. one of the things I admire about what you say, Paul, is the, the, the honesty. And you were saying earlier, uh, before this, this event, that you had a lot of criticism online, a lot of grief and trolling and other things for some of those yeah. views. But um, certainly I think the world of parenting is riddled with people projecting an image that everything is perfect, which actually doesn't help other people who are, who are struggling as well. So um, thank you for that. It's a lot of food for thought. Um, I think we have hit our 8.30 time. I know there's probably lots more questions people would like to have, but I'm, I'm in kind of honour of those people who are, have come from a distance, and I know people do and need to get away, then we're going to wrap up at 8.30 like we promised. So first of all, please join me in giving Paul a big round of applause. Thank you.